Amen. Are you ready for God's word? I, I want you to remain standing and turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 11, and we will start with verse number 11. We're continuing a series. train hard. And I want to pick up with verse number 11 of Mark 11. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Father God, may we bear fruit evidence of repentance in our life. And may we produce much fruit for your glory because that's what you ask of us and expect of us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said a big <clears throat> amen. You may be seated. Shannon and I spent just a little time in Israel. We just got back about two weeks ago. Toward the end of our time there, we had a certain waiter at a restaurant, 20-year-old young man named Moses, which is an appropriate Jewish name, I assume, asked us where we're from, and we told him where we're from. And he made, kind of, you could sense his sense of being proud to be uh, from Israel and Jewish. And so he began to speak to how proud he was of it and all these great things. And I asked him a question about Purim. Purim was just happened and asked him a little bit more about that holiday from his perspective. And I could tell that he was caught off guard. Uh, and then he really didn't have any answers for me. He goes away, comes back, and he makes it very clear to me, oh yeah, Purim is like, like Halloween. And I kind of looked at him and realized he did not know, and he's probably gathering that information from somebody else quickly. And, and then I just asked him to go read the book of Esther and so that he could know about his history and so that he would understand more about what it means to be a Jew. And I thought of this in regards to us because a lot of times we say we're one thing, a Christian, but yet we do not understand fully what that means because we're lacking the fruit in our life that we need. In this story that I just read to you, it is during the week, the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. Actually, the day is Monday. And in this story, Jesus gives us two live or acted out parables. One of them is a parabolic miracle, which is the cursing of the fig tree, which is a act of decreation. Many times the miracles you have in the Bible is acts of recreation or creation, but this is actually a miracle of decreation. The figs on the Fruit tree is of the, folk, of the ficus tree group or the mulberry tree family. And the fig tree is found throughout the Bible from the book of Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. And it is common knowledge that in Jesus' time that if you saw leaves on a fig tree, you could expect fruit. And Jesus being hungry goes over and sees no fruit and he curses the fig tree. The second live or acted out parable happened in the temple. I didn't read all of it, but you got this understanding of Jesus going into the temple, but it was late in the afternoon. He was scouting out things. He goes back to Bethany, stays the night, and as he comes back from Bethany that morning, headed toward the temple, he curses the fig tree, and then he goes into the temple, and when he's in the temple, he begins to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocks over tables, he knocks over chairs, and he stops people from using the temple as a marketplace. And he says these words. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, 
but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Matter of fact, this is premeditated by, by Jesus. It wasn't just on the spur of the moment. In fact, after he had focused the temple and scouted it out, he goes back and the scripture says in the book of John chapter two that he made a whip and he shows back up with the whip to use in the temple. Now, I don't know about you, but this can be confusing about my ideas of who Jesus is. Where is the compassionate, the merciful, the kind Jesus? Who is this new guy? Because I'm used to seeing a meek and mild idea of a Messiah, but here he is bringing justice, judgment. He is awaking people. But I can understand a little bit when I look into my own life in regards to this Jesus versus what we sometimes think, because I've had people all my life talk about how sweet my mom is, how merciful, how kind, how loving and compassionate and how embracing and hospitable my mom is. But there was every once in a while a side of my mom that no one else saw. When we had pushed her buttons just right and she began to boil up to a certain point, she could begin to be a whole different person than what other people saw. And out of her emotion, she would use that to get our attention. Oh, how many times have I been there and finally she's fed up with us boys not producing the fruit that we need to be producing. And she says, go out to the tree and you get a switch. I, I don't know, most of you never, you don't even know of such. You don't even know what I'm talking about. But back in the day, whenever I was a kid, I had to go out sometimes to get my own switch. And you know what I'm The hardest thing to do is look at a tree and to pick out which limb is gonna hurt the least. Break that limb off and bring it back into mom so that I can get a spanking. In both of these stories, Jesus is frustrated about the lack of spiritual fruit that was happening. Notice the word Bethany shows up many times. Do you know what the word Bethany means? It means house of figs or house of fruit. It is the home, the location of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Remember? It right here this week, Jesus is using this time to go back and forth from Bethany. And, it, and it just give you an understanding of what this is like distance wise. You got the, the Temple Mount. You look out to the east, you see the Mount of Olives. And just over the hill of Mount Olives is Bethany, which is about a mile and a half to two miles away from the Temple Mount. And Jesus is basing here those last few days of his life before he goes to the cross. This is the place where he spoke to a man named Lazarus who had been dead for four days. Lazarus come forth and he comes out of the grave. This is the place where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, anoints his body for crucifixion. This is the place where after his death, burial, and resurrection, 40 days later, he ascends back into the heavens and the angels descend down and say, this same Jesus that you saw go into heaven is gonna come back in like manner. And it's the very place that it speaks of in Zechariah and also Revelation that Jesus will come back and set his feet on the Mount of Olives. Bethany, house of figs or fruit. Which brings me to some thoughts. First off is this. Jesus says that fruit is the focus. Fruit is the focus. When Shannon and I bought a home on 4100 Karen Drive, now it's been some 19 years ago, we bought this home and there was two pecan trees that were relatively young, but they should have actually started producing. And in my optimism, I was excited about the pecan trees because I grew up with pecan trees not far from my house at a little creek. And we'd go down there in the fall and we would get those pecans. And I thought that was just such a pleasant, wonderful thing to be able to get. And so I was actually anticipating the fruit of these pecan trees. But year after year, they would drop shells, but those shells were empty. Never once in 14 years of living there did we get one pecan. And me, like Jesus, cursed those trees. <laughs> me, unlike Jesus, didn't see them wither from the roots up. John chapter number 15 says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't sit with me, produce fruit. Have you ever been somewhere and you see fruit on a table and you walk toward it anticipating to get some of the fruit? And then have you ever reached for it and all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's fake fruit? Come on, there's been a couple of times that I've actually touched it before I realized it was fake. And, and I'll tell you another thing that may be just as demoralizing is when you see some fruit and you reach over and grab it and it's rotten fruit. 
In the book of Mark, chapter number seven, Jesus is warning against those that worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're fake. They're producing something fake. They're producing something that's rotten. John chapter 15, Jesus continues, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce that with me much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, fruit is evidence of our character, our conduct, and converts. What do I mean by that? When we begin to produce the fruit that's evidence of repentance, our character, that's what's down deep inside of us, is gonna reflect Christ. And see, here's something about character. You can cover it up for a while and you can hide it for a while, but eventually it's going to rise to the surface. Eventually what's inside of you, when the buttons are pushed just right, when the temperature gets turned up, when it begins to get a little bit stressed out and all the things, eventually what's down deep inside of you is going to manifest itself. I, I don't know about you, but I want the fruit of the Spirit inside of me. So when I'm at work, when I'm at home, wherever I'm at and the buttons are being pushed in my heart and my life and there's something that rises up, I want joy and love and peace and patience and goodness and I, I want to have faithfulness and I want to have gentleness and I want to have self-control rise up inside of me. And, and, and then also character leads to conduct because eventually the conduct, and we can cover our conduct up for a while, but eventually the character is gonna reveal itself through our conduct. You see, the conduct is what comes out of us. It is what we show to others. It is. But here's the objective, that when you are having fruit produced in abundance in your life, the character will be there, the conduct will come out, and there will be converts that want to follow you. What do I mean by that? It means that other people are gonna see what you have, and they're gonna want to have what you have, and they're gonna follow you to get what you have. Oh, oh. The problem is in a lot of Christians today is other people are looking at us and saying, I don't really want that version of Jesus. Come on, we have an idea or a version of Jesus. We need to go back to the biblical version of who Jesus is and say, you know what? I wanna be that type of Christian that at work, when the buttons and it gets hot and it gets difficult at work, I want people to see a Christ come out of me that they're going to want to follow and they're gonna to want to experience the Jesus that I am following. Which brings me to the second thought. The second thought is fruit is evidence of faith. Fruit is evidence of faith. That evening when Jesus left the city, the next morning they returned back in the fig tree that was cursed. The disciples saw it withered from its roots up and Peter remembers what Jesus said. He says, Master, look, this, this fig tree is dead. And Jesus says this in verse 22. Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. What is that about? You cannot have real spiritual fruit apart from faith in God. You can have the appearance of it. You can have rotten fruit, something that this world offers, but it's not gonna be real and genuine. Fruit comes through faith in God. In the book of Genesis, the first couple, they, they placed their faith in something other than God. They began to listen to the voice of the serpent and they began to believe what was being said and they actually reached for the forbidden fruit and took of that fruit, which is never gonna satisfy, it's going to taste rotten. Eventually it may, because there's pleasure in sin for a season, but they're gonna wake up and you're gonna have a sour stomach and you're gonna have a taste in your mouth that is not gonna be good when you choose the fruit of this world. And it says in verse seven, at that moment their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Did you get that? Fig leaves, leaves, leaves. It's, it's about figs, not leaves. It's about fruit, not the leaves that will just cover your outward and you make yourself look okay. It's about a real understanding of what it means to have faith in God. And faith in God is about obedience. And Adam and Eve felt to obey God completely and wholeheartedly. And it cost them greatly. The brother of Jesus says these words in the book of James, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. 
And see, real faith in God means that you trust God with everything, even in the pruning process. Because if you're gonna produce more fruit, you've gotta give yourself to the pruning process. Being raised on the farm, one of the things that I learned early on, it was kind of confusing for me initially, was the pruning process. Because I would see all of these plants and my dad would show me to get the weeds. And then after getting the weeds, he would show me how to cultivate or to remove some of the beautiful plants. And I would think, like, this doesn't make sense. This, why am I taking something good away? And dad began to teach me and I began to see the evidence over time that you actually have to trim back some of the good so that you can have even greater. Come on, because it is the good that is the enemy of the greater in our lives. And it's something called suckers, dad would tell me. These little suckers, you ever seen a branch and these little limbs begin to go off of them? And eventually you gotta begin to take those little suckers off because it's those little suckers that's keeping the whole plant of producing the maximum amount of fruit possible. And I've got a, something I wanna ask you. Are there any suckers in your life? Come on, are there any people that are sucking the spiritual life out of you? Come on, are there any situations and hobbies and activities and stuff that's keeping you from producing the fruit that God has in store for you? Come on, we gotta cut back the suckers so that we can produce all that God wants in our lives. Jesus said it this way, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more, even more. Now, I have a guy that I know, his name, he, he in college, he was doing a speech class, a basic speech class. Very gifted communicator. He's actually a minister now, and he's just one of the most prolific speakers, just really, really gifted. But he's always been, just naturally gifted as a communicator. And in the speech class, um, his different friends were speaking. They get graded. He's one of the last ones to speak. He gets up, does his speech. He's graded. He's given a B minus. And then he began to find out that several of his friends make an A's, pretty much all of them made A's. And he made a B minus. He schedules a meeting with the professor and goes in and says, I don't understand this. I'm about the only one that got an applause. And my, mess, my, my speech was better than anyone in the class. The professor looked at him and he said, Andy, I am not measuring you up against them. Because Andy, did you really give it your best did you give, no, Andy, you, you just got up and winged it because you're good at it. I'm not measuring you compared to somebody else. I'm measuring you up against yourself and you can do a lot more. Come on, and on that day, your fruit is not gonna be measured up against your spouse or your kids or your parents or your pastor or anyone else. You're gonna be measured according to your obedience to God. Did you give yourself to the pruning process and did he do all that he could do in your life? Did you let him do that? Which brings me to the last thought. Fruit must be fertilized. Fruit must be fertilized. In, in a field that's, and I've seen this lays dormant, that field that's left dormant for one year will still produce fruit. But it won't produce the maximum amount of fruit. Why is that? Because it's not cultivated, it's not fertilized, it's not developed, it's not taken care of. And the longer you go without taking care of and giving attention to your personal field, the less fruit and the more weeds that you're gonna have springing up. Jesus said it this way, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you, say it with me, remain in me. Now, guys, you guys say it better. Come on, Guthrie, help me out. Remain in me. Remaining in Christ is the secret to fertilizing spiritual fruit. What does that mean? Let, let me give you how you remain. You remain first in the word of God. This is Jesus from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It points us to Jesus. The word of God does. And we gotta stay in the word of God. In Mark chapter number four in our reading plan, Jesus tells the story of the, the seed that was sown on four different types of ground. And he says that the seed is the word of God and the first seed is planted on rocky soil and the birds come along and just take it and run off with it. Let me just say that that seed, that word is individuals that are easily distracted. They just are just mentally just not connected. They're not grounded. They're not even 
getting it. It's just, it's there. Then it sounds good. It feels good. I'm in church. Oh, that sounds really good. I kind of like that principle. And then boom, it's gone. The, the second type of soil that Jesus talked about was a soil that actually was good soil, but it was not very deep. And the seed was planted. But then as it began to grow, the drought, the heat began to beat down on it. And then it wilted under the heat. And this is like a lot of Christians that you got just enough of the word of God. It makes you feel good because you're convinced that you can by osmosis give some things that you got over the weekend when you came to church and you kind of know how to say a little bit of the right stuff. But when the pressures of life and the stress of life and the weight of life and sickness comes your way, you are not deep in the word of God and you begin to wilt and fall away. The third type of soil is some that was good soil and was planted and it began to grow. And as it began to grow, it says that the thorns or the weeds, different translations said differently, begin to wrap around it. You know what this is? This is the to-do list. This is the individuals that the word of God, you've got everything you need. You're surrounded by it. You're faithful there. You're, you're making it. You're actually even doing some of your own personal devos in the morning. You're giving yourself a little bit. You're, you've got good soil all around you. But the busyness of life and the cares of life and the pleasures of life begin to choke out the spiritual life out of you. But then there's the fourth soil. It's good soil and it begins to grow up. And it says that it produces 60 to 100 fold. I don't know about you, but I wanna be that. I wanna produce much, much fruit for my king, for my savior. Then also prayer. Prayer is a part of it. Did you notice in this passage, if you go back and look in verse 23 and 24, it says, I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen, but you must really believe it will happen and not doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that over the years. Pray for anything, but then as time has went on in my life and I've continually went back to prayer, I've seen the mountains move in my life. I have seen God do incredible things. One, one of my staff people pointed out to some plants that's in, our, in my room. You don't give up much attention to them, but they were starting to wilt. I, I, didn't, I wasn't even paying attention to it. And both the, Crystal said, hey, Brock, Pastor, you gotta water these things every so often or they're gonna die. And it's your responsibility. You realize prayer is not somebody else's responsibility, it's your responsibility. And if you don't give yourself to the prayer life that, talking to God, you're gonna to begin to wilt. You're going to begin to waste away. And it will happen so, so slowly, you won't even realize it. So subtly, it will happen. Which brings me to the, another thought. Not only you gotta give yourself and remain in the word of God and a prayer, but also in the spiritual community with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, and prayer connects us together. Prayer is not separate. Your vertical conversation with God will impact your horizontal conversation with others. It does. How do I know that? Notice in the passage here, he points it out. He says it this way, but when you are praying to God vertically, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against horizontally so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. That's a connectedness. We are connected together. It impacts I can talk about just me and God all I want, but no, 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 no. My relationship with God impacts the people around me and vice versa. In Matthew chapter number five, Jesus says it this way. If you come to the altar and you bring your sacrifice and you walk up and at the altar, you remember the Holy Spirit brings back, remembers that there is a problem between you and somebody, leave your gift at the altar, go back and take care of the relation. Let be reconciled with your brother and sister of the Lord and then come back to the altar and make your sacrifice unto God. Does that make sense? See, a lot of us aren't producing the fruit that we need to produce because of broken relationships. Because of lack of reconciliation, you're called to the ministry of reconciliation. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that the person on the other end is gonna do exactly what they should do, but you've gotta do what you should be doing. You're not responsible for them, but you are responsible for you. So 21 years ago, I had a brother in Christ make some statements about me. But you know what? I've always kind of felt like I can take anything. If you're, anybody feel that way? I, you're not gonna offend me. But I was offended. And that stayed with me for a long time. For years, it stayed with me. 
even though I knew that I was doing the right thing and I would search my heart and talk to somebody and I actually went to this person, I'm sorry for the thoughts that I had. But, but, but it was weird because I kept, I just could not, I'd be playing golf. Back when I used to play golf, I don't play golf anymore, but I'd stand over a putt. I'd be having fun with some guys around me. I'd stand over the putt and right about the time I get my back stroke, this person's face and words would come back to me. And the hole would be over there and I'd putt like over there. And it was like freaking me out. And over time I began to realize that I felt like God was allowing this thorn in me so that I would learn to depend on him, not me for fruit. And walk in that. Man. Got through in Oklahoma City. Everyone else, I want you to stand with me. Stand. First off, with every eye looking this way, this message is about spiritual fruit. And not just some, but much fruit and producing much fruit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to individuals that are listening to me right now about reconciling with brother or sister. Or maybe you have, and like me, you know what I had to do? I had to keep bringing it to the altar. Even though I knew I was doing the right thing, I, I was still feeling those feelings. But remember this, feelings aren't faith. You walk in faith whether you feel whatever you feel or not. You keep doing what's right and obeying God no matter what you're feeling. And over time, God will begin to align the feelings to the faith, but first you gotta walk in faith. Does that make sense? Obey him. Oh, some of you are carrying issues right now that needs to be reconciled, needs to be brought. Or maybe you have, but you're still wrestling in the feelings. You need to come forward and say, God, I'm giving it to you again. I'm giving it to you again, just like I had to do many, many times again and again and again. In Guthrie and Oklahoma City, now is the time to respond to this message. Don't wait, don't sit back there. If you're in the middle of the aisle, get out and begin to come. And number two is this. God is speaking to individuals about producing more fruit. You are not producing the fruit that God is calling you to do. You know that, you know that there's some, maybe it's not remaining in the word of God. You're not remaining in prayer. You're not remaining in Christian community. God is calling you out to produce greater fruit and you realize that your fruit is not what it should be. With eyes closed, no one looking around. Spirit of God, do your work. Do your work among us. We ask this, Holy Spirit, go. Tug on people's hearts. Convince us of our need to trust you right now to see God produce much fruit in our lives.